Well, hello out there. This is RPG with DBJ. I am your host, DBJ. And today, as we have been doing for, oh, wow, a month now, is um, world building each and every day. And today is no exception. Uh, we are going to dive into, I've got my superheroes <laughs> t-shirt. Um, we're going to dive into world building with world wars. Um, in this world building series, uh, especially when we start talking about the time periods, it's, it's our way of selling to you the idea of, of world building in these time periods without um, necessarily using those specific time periods unless you're a historian. It's, it's like, it's basically the idea of us going like, you know, for those who are like, nah, I don't really feel any draw towards, you know, including anything in my game. Why should I? And then so we, we, it's us talking about um, some of the elements of that time period in our real world, how we can blend those things in our um, our specific role playing games, and like why would we want to do it, and what are some of the the ramifications of playing in a world and then blending it in blending it in what we're going to do. So today we're talking about world war. Now we've kind of, yesterday was my way of like, I crammed a lot into the, uh, yesterday's episode about um, the age of exploration. I should, I should go back and read and change it. Uh, Vince came up with the name of the age of exploration. And basically it was the beginnings of the uh, pulp action era um, in terms of blending like Old West and uh, samurai and ancient Aztec and deep African and um, uh, Victorian England and like combining all those things together into, in, into a, hey Vince, into a way of us talking about uh, basically blending different cultures that existed at that time and then and then bringing them together um, the the beginnings of technology and our our desire to explore the world and uncovering dark things so now we're getting into uh, basically where a, a lot of the where a lot of the pulp action actually took place but this time we're going to talk about world wars. Uh, Zevron 08 says, anyone curious, Eberron as a campaign setting had a world war. Don't know if that, that's that been said, just arrived. Yeah, we're, we're just preambling now, just to see if, um, uh, letting people get in, log in. So usually I don't get started too early. Uh, so it's just a preamble, but there's a lot of game settings. Um, the one that comes to, to, to mind for me is, uh, is um, I was about to say World of Warcraft. Um, 40k it is it is a, a setting that is like war taken to the extreme so what i really want to want to talk about is not the specifics of who was involved or how world war 1 started and all that kind of business it's the idea of a setting in which there is nothing but war right you you have to pick a side you've been um, maybe drafted into. If you aren't involved in it, there is a war going on. It is the idea that you you walk out your front door and there's minor gaps of peace or respite. Um, there's there's rest and relaxation for very minute amounts of time in between more war breaking out, and very few, uh, unless the game specifically is either historical. Like like playing in World War One or World War Two, or a a fictional World War Three, um, apocalyptic type setting. Usually the wars have already happened, or the threat is that a war is about to happen. I'm talking about a setting in which there is war, where you may be drafted into it, where there is battle, where um, th there isn't much rest and. Uh, I have to big, give a big shout out to um, Dan Carlin's um, Hardcore History. Uh, Dan Carlin's Hardcore History uh, podcast, and each podcast, I mean, it's it's a tough sell, right? Because each podcast is about three to five hours long. 
but I cannot, cannot um, oversell the fact that Dan Carlin's uh, hardcore history is 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 awesome. I mean, you really should take a look at it. And it's um, um, Countdown to Armageddon is the is the series, and I believe each episode's like three to five hours, and there are like four or five episodes a piece. Yeah, Foolish Cube says Hardcore History is a great show, and his he's got a he's got a a, a way of speaking, especially when he he starts reading things verbatim that he like really draws you into it. It's some would 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 consider it dry. I don't listening to it. I don't, and it's really great. Uh, Dead Man Storyteller says next we can we can world build with the Atomic Age, then world build in modern age, then world build with the near future. Space travel, world building, a far future. I absolutely agree with that. And one of, one of the things I really loved that encompassed the hardcore history that uh, Dan Carlin um, uh, lectured on is the idea that that countries could take a punch. And this is when um, entrenchment became a thing. It's it's the idea that. Uh, battles didn't take place with 10,000 people over a week and then one side gave up versus the other. It was more of battles took place over months and then many months and then a year and then a year and a half went by. And it, it became very expensive because at one, it became hard to basically kill or rout your enemy, right? Um, in in the medieval era, you era you had castles and you sieged the castle. Either you could get through the castle or you didn't. But but something would happen, right? It was a, I mean, I, I hate to simplify it, but it was an on off switch. You either got into the castle and then everybody would give up, and you know you you, you couldn't get in the castle and you didn't have enough resources, and one person would give up. And it, I mean, these kind of things would bankrupt uh, nations. And during World War One, you had army sitting out there and some of them were firing so many bullets and using so many explosives they couldn't keep up with the production of the amount of uh, of ordnance they were throwing at each other and then they still couldn't get people out of you know pillboxes and entrenchments and things like that uh zevron um says uh families of clans could be formed from former veterans um it says in Skyrim, the Grey Mains and battle, um, Battleborns and nobles in each family up until the Civil War had their children join the military for service. Yeah, the, the age of like being born into a military family, joining the military, and then, you know, in a way, having your own family that would do the same thing is a thing, right? Um, yeah, world building age of empires, Finn says. Yeah, it's it's... It became, in a way, it was like the death of of the honor of battle. Not, not that there were many battles in real history where there weren't, you know, atrocities committed, but the idea of like sitting and, you know, charging over across a battlefield with your sword drawn on a horse and stuff like that um, just became, it, 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 it the, the glorious, survival of battle died because they had to come up with ways to get people out of out of their entrenchments right there were so many defense battle defenses became tough enough that they could protect people from the the battle at hand and so um it was it became necessary to have greater weapons to to basically kick people's asses because there were so many people involved. A, a Foolish Kiwi says, world wars also tend to generate mass economic shifts and technological advancements regardless of the time or setting. And that's the deal, right? Like there were there were technological advancements simply because they couldn't kill enough people. Um, uh, calling up here, the, the you know, just doing a, a little um, wiki foo. I mean, they're, they're talking about the fact that like uh, just in World War One. It led to the mobilization of more than 70 million military personnel, including 60 million Europeans, make it, making it one of the largest wars in history. It is also one of the deadliest, with an estimated 9 million combatants and 7 million civilian deaths as a direct result of war, 
while resulting genocides and the 1918 influenza pandemic caused more than 50 to 100 million deaths worldwide. That's crazy. I mean, that's, that's you know, um, uh, Vince and I talked about the fact that, you know, uh, 10 deaths is, 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 uh, is a shame and 100 deaths is a tragedy, but 100 million deaths is a statistic, right? It, it gets to the point where you have so many deaths that people become traumatized and numb to it. And so that made me think of something else. Um, as Allah says, remember the world, world War was the end of the age of awesome mustaches because they in interfered with gas masks. <laughs> you know what? There's even images of people riding into battle with that blend of the old and new, like they, they would have like sabers on horses with wearing gas masks and stuff. I mean, the, the, the origination of like, like mustard gas and flamethrowers and like um, uh, shrapnel bombs with shrapnel in them and all that stuff came about because you, you couldn't just pick up a rifle and shoot someone if they were in a pillbox, you had to figure out a way to get them out of there. And that's where the, the no man's land came from. Um, bringing up a movie, Wonder Woman goes across, you know, where you say no man can go across that. And she's like, I'm no man. I mean, she doesn't exactly say that, but you understand the point where you had these, these no man's lands of like death because no one could cross over to the other person's territory. So you couldn't advance, but you, then you couldn't retreat either. And if there, if there was any retreating, it was like, you know, tactical because you would burn and destroy everything on your way. Um, Zevron 08 says, all that matters is evocation and, and abjuration, protecting your people and killing as many of the enemy as, as efficiently as you could. Exactly. I mean, sure, magic missile works, but man, some of that the poison gas, that burning hand spells, you know what I mean? Shield is fine, but you're going to need like a ton of other magics to protect everyone. And using like I could have been, imagined just you could very easily insert magic in terms of technological advancements in terms of protecting people, right? The, the, um, the clerics that are healing people and throwing people back out into the battlefield would just um, allow one side versus the other to take a greater punch. Um, yeah, dead man, the storyteller says, it, it's a good thing I'm no man, you know, and then just like, you know, being able to stand out there, like the machine gun was a, was a big deal, right? The bigger and better machine guns, howitzers, you know, l launching just ordnance for, for miles and miles away and just carpet bombing areas. Um, Foolish Kiwi says, there's an anime called um, Yo Yojo uh, Senki, where it's World War I, except an alternate timeline where magic wasn't forgotten. So instead of artillery, there's mages, but also rifles is a neat take. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> Zevron says, maybe a few transportation spells. Earth Mold is pretty good for making trenches. Uh, I absolutely agree with that. You know, oftentimes when, when we talk about um, magic in war, we usually talk about it on one side, right? Like, oh, if someone's got fireballs, no one would make explosives. And But no one talks about the defensive portion of that, the, the anti-magic shells, the walls of force, the, the melding earth, the walls of stone and fire that would be, that would be used just as well, the, the uh, rampant use of summoning uh, elementals or outer world beings and just launching them over walls and things like that. Yeah, it, it's... Um, it's crazy. Vince says, recently saw a history of tanks. Fascinating stuff. They were named tank because they did not want their enemies to guess what it was. You know, um, I, I'm, I'm, something came up in, in my head. So I want to uh, share a little something or, or actually talk with you guys with something, uh, which is kind of strange. And that is the slang, um, the, the slang of uh, World War I. And the fact that some of these words came about and you didn't realize where they came from. Yeah, so Foolish Kiwis mentions uh, conventions and laws against inhumane spells. Yeah, oh, there would definitely be that, be the, the idea of like, um, of, uh, I don't know, not not casting sleep spell and then shooting them in their sleep or something. Like, <laughs> that would be pretty nasty. But I even, I even, I even think that the idea of an eternal war is something that's not really 
something that we do or even talk about in role playing games, right? You know, we 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 PCs, we you know, role players are like, "Hey, I'm going to fight to fight a couple of creatures, take a short or long rest and then go back to fighting." We don't think about ourselves hiding in caves or hiding in trenches while I don't know, I'm just making making this up, while 5,000 fireballs go off over our heads over a six day period, right? We don't we don't think about like a random, like a, a, a D100 list or a D20 list where um, every round there's a chance that some random lightning bolt or uh, explosive rune or anything like that will go off. Could you imagine instead of a, like a minefield, there's like explosive runes everywhere. And if you, you step on one, not only might it explode, but maybe it might summon a, a horrible creature or teleport you two miles in the air or um, freeze your body with ice or something like that. I mean, just the idea that 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 there really isn't rest, uh, the psychological trauma of just seeing your your allies, bodies just exploded, things like that, it would just be crazy. Um, uh, Dead Man the Storyteller says in uh, second edition, um, AD and D had the Castle Builders Guide that covers the use of spells in warfare. Um, yeah, the, the the using certain spells while quite enhancing for PCs, um, some of them may not even be very effective or would have a singular effect in battle. Like for example, we all think of like a. Um, the, the, the major spellcasters casting like fireballs or meteor swarms. But if if that one spellcaster has like an attitude or is like, oh, I can cast it once or twice and then I gotta go rest, you know, there would be military commanders like, I don't, I don't need an 18th level wizard. I need like 50 first level spellcasters casting magic missiles, right? How how much more effective is it having 50 acolytes Casting spells that are ver that are cantrips versus one magic user that's got an attitude, right? It, it's um, it, it it's it's about s situational effectiveness. Can you count on you know twenty magi that are loyal to you but that aren't very powerful versus like two or three magi that have like a bunch of demands or even even the the spell components is if one person's like well I need a I need a fifth size diamond every time they need to do something the military commander's like I don't need you fifth fifth size diamond we don't have time to do that we need we need to send you out in the battlefield sitting back here who, who do you think you are anyhow um anyway um a foolish kiwi says oof runes inscribed on equipment so it explodes if non corresponding gloves pick it up I like that. I like that a lot. You know, wagons with really important uh, personages or documents in it or or powerful artifacts are like covered in runes. And if you don't have the right, yeah, ID cards have ID tags. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> I like that a lot. Oh, man. Oh, um, yeah. Don't don't mix up the gloves, the wrong gloves or something. Um, uh, you, you could even have battlefield tanks covered in runes. So that like even the, the the battlefield machines can't be uh, infiltrated if you if you touch them the wrong way or or read the runes or something that like ex impact you and they don't even have to be explosive they can have some other random spell effect whether it turns you into a frog or teleports you or freezes you in place or something like that petrifies you or something like that it'd be kind of nasty um vince says battlefield control would be the most important most impactful spells just uh raise a metal wall in front of an enemy and create a chance for advancement i, I like that I, absolutely um teleport spells uh zevron says yeah uh because teleport spells could take you behind enemy lines maybe and then have them like fire um lightning bolts down trenches or something like that um for, uh, grease spells uh, like like uh vince says co battlefield control like anything that blinds people uh disrupts their movement um yeah absolutely foolish kiwi says maybe implementing a mechanic for working together on spells allowing you to make them hit a larger area yeah i i, I think that would us thinking organically right if if more magi or you know spellcasters arcane summoners or something could work together 
and in if in this world or setting, the more you have, the larger area it affects. So maybe 10 of them working together could cover a mile with like poison gas or fog or or um I don't know, um some kind of icy rain or whatever it is. Uh, it, yeah, absolutely. Um heat waves or be able to maybe extend a wall of fire over miles and miles of territory or, or all the way around a castle wall if if like 15 of them work together um using their powers all at once uh using you know so-called spell slots basically um zevron says not much you can do if, if a bomb is teleported into your camp that is a, unless see we, we we like to talk about the the offensive side but the defensive side could be anti-magic dispel magics um invisibilities um lots of illusions um um dissemination of false information uh teleporting into a location and then the person that teleports in gets stuck and can't get back out or um so th it's it there would be um uh anti magics not just anti magic shells but uh the use of anti magics to disrupt what other people are doing uh, as well, so you you could have like um, uh, anti scrying, uh, those kind of things, or uh, such. Now, mind you, once somebody teleports in, if if they get anywhere close to you, you're done. Uh, if they can teleport in and then get get the hell back out, unless you have people who are willing to sacrifice themselves, um, or doing something to trace the person who teleports in and then tracing them back to where they came from when they teleport back out. Uh, is is a possibility as well. Um, Tesla Ranger says, "Why use your own? Summoned or cr uh, created undead monsters, elementals, golems? Hell yeah, man! Golems covered in runes. Um, definitely the undead. Uh, just like you like you said, elementals, fire elementals, earth elementals. Just just you know, just rampaging and stuff. Oh, that is, of course, they don't get out of hand. Um, the anti version of that would be." uh releasing those monsters from their service and they could rebel against the ones that summon them in the first place um or just banishing them back to where they came from would be just as important as well so defensive magics uh as was mentioned earlier defensive magics would be um a thing um <laughs> zephron says then you have spies that pose as mouses or birds yeah <laughs> familiars being being um would be excellent um excellent easy uh, spies getting you information that you need across um, enemy lines. Although that would mean, that would also mean that everyone's killing like rabbits and frogs and birds and things that fly on their side too, J just for the um, sole purpose of, of the fact that just one of them might be a spy. So they kill off all the birds and stuff would be pretty nasty. Um, Foolish Kiwi says, for example, sound waves of the same frequency hit hit each other, they add up maybe mana and anti-mana works the same way. Like don't cross beams, <laughs> but actually do cross them, it's awesome. Yeah, you know what, like th they're in a world of organic magic, right? Is is there a, would there be battles over just being able to weave the magic in the first place? Kind of like tapping a ley line, like it, it would, would you have, a battle over just harnessing the magic before it's able to explode outwards or would there be a danger in using magic and then giving up your tactical advantage when everyone else knows who you are what you've done um how much power you've used um and then trace you back to where you came from you know if if for example let's say a wizard in in a i don't know hidden behind some kind of like siege tower cast a spell and teleport some some soldiers in is there a way that oh once they cast a spell now we can send in you know our enemies to track them down to teleport or whatever have you um to where that wizard is you know um that, that would be that would be kind of cool to use that but um uh going on to this um this, this uh what i i never knew is that there's a lot of words that came from war just be just because war created it um words like um basket case um you know it's it's like a uh it, it came from what was it while it tends to be used in a fairly lighthearted war way today 
um, usually someone who makes uh, stupid mistakes. The original basket case is an unexpectedly gruesome reminder just how bloody war became. A uh, basket case was a soldier who had been so badly injured that he had to be carried from the battlefield in a barrel or basket, usually with the implication that he lost, had lost all four of his limbs. Uh, there's blimp. Um, the booby trap was another one. Um, cooties. <laughs> um, a nickname for body lice or head lice. Cooties first appeared in trenches. Slang in 1915 is apparently derived from the coot, a species of waterfowl supposedly known for being infested with lice and other parasites. I didn't know that. Uh, cooties, crump hole, daisy cutter, dingbat, uh, iron rations. Uh, the, the expression iron rations was used as early as 1860s to describe a soldier's dry emergency rations which typically included a selection of hard, gritty provisions like rice, barley, bread, biscuits, salt, and bacon. Uh, during the First World War, however, the term came to be used as a nickname for shrapnel or shell fire. Did not know that. Uh, I did not know that. Oh, uh, But yeah, there's this kind of things. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, Zevran Oasis, how, how do monstrous races factor in? Do orcs and hobgoblins become mercenaries? Are they a neutral party? I can't imagine anyone in in this context would be neutral like you'd have to pick a side and it could be that like orcs and hobgoblins might be mercenaries or like in in many ways um cannon fodder thrown at each other's side they like they could become the new they could have been harnessed as battlefield um expendables turning them into what we consider a monstrous race when maybe they weren't a monstrous race at all, either bred that way or coaxed to be that way, um, et cetera. Um, a storyteller says uh, Metallica's a song, One, is about a guy who lost all limbs and was rendered mute. Ooh, that's nasty. Ugh. Yeah, uh, Azal says the, the song Blood on the Risers, gory, 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 what a hell of a, hell of a way to die. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's pretty nasty. Um, Kipo, uh, shell shock is a, is, a, is a term. Although the adjec adjective shell shocked has been tracked back as far as 1898, um, uh, when it was first used slightly differently to mean subjected to heavy fire, the first true cases of shell shock emerged during World War, the First World War. Um, only one case of shell shock has become under my observation. A Belgian officer was the victim. A shell burst near him without inflicting any physical injury. He presents it practically complete loss of sensation in the lower extremities and much loss of sensation. And of course, shell shock turns into um, battle fatigue and then battle fatigue turned into um, to, uh, PTSD. Uh, strafe, the word strafe, um, you know, we will be considered to be strafing fire today, but that that came about. Uh, zigzag is another one. Um, has been used in English since the 18th century uh, to describe a meandering line or course, but during the First World War came to be used as a euphemism for drunkenness, presumably referring to the zigzagging walk of a soldier who had one too many. And then, of course, we talk about zigzagging through, you know, <laughs> the, the hell out of the way of... Um, of, of being shot and killed, right? It's it's the zigzagging through uh, past enemy fire. But those are just examples of like how uh, a war could could present itself um, as uh, changing changing uh, society, changing slang, changing language, uh, changing how we deal with each other. Uh, uh, Zevron's 08 says, perhaps there are, are given citizenship rights in exchange for service. I'm reminded of America and black people, right? Many, many um, uh, people at war, if they didn't have enough personnel, offered like citizenship or money or some kinds of like benefits if you would join their effort. And in many ways, like a world war, that's exactly what it would be, right? If you're an ally of another country, um, you know, many kings would recruit from their neighboring, their neighbors. Like, listen, you've been, uh, I've been protecting you for 27 years. Now you need to bring your people onto my side. And then that king is like, well, or, or Duke or whatever it is, Baron or whatever leadership they are. They're like, okay, well, what's in it for me? What's in it for my people? Um, some of it was the, the idea of three hots and a cot, 
right? It's the, it's the oh, um, hey, you're suffering from famine. We'll feed you if you fight for our side. And, or we'll take care of your family if you fight for our side kind of thing. Um, so yes, yeah, citizenship rights, money, um, some being the promise that your children could advance in society when when people were pretty much placed into a, a very uh, hard line stratified uh, uh, culturally. So yeah, if you wanted to raise up in stature, maybe you know it was the idea of um, ra your child becoming a knight or a squire or uh, becoming a samurai. And for yourself, it wasn't so much for yourself, it was for those that could uh, rise above their stations. And, and, uh, and then of course we just sent them off you got to sacrifice him, right? Kill him off. Um, Azala says, um, here's a thought. Maybe uh, exosuits turned into golems for magical power armor that people can wear. <laughs> It'd be pretty nasty if you can't get out of it. <laughs> you're in it, and then they send you out the war, and then they're just like, nah, we need you to stay out there for a couple more days. And you're like, I need to get out of this suit. And you're just like, that would be nasty. Or, or um, um, mechanized golem suits filled with, uh, like, ghosts or oozes so anyone that destroys the golems the oozes spill out of the of the, of the golems so you're hoping that the golems walk through no man's land being assaulted by you know everything then the golems open up and dump oozes down into the trenches um oh and then you cover the golems in um dangerous runes like explosive runes or something just in case someone tries to uh booby trap them or whatnot and then Inside of that, you put maybe ghosts, <laughs> banshees, or something. I don't know. I'm just being, I'm being, being pretty nasty. Although then you could, you could infiltrate rust monsters into the other side and just let them loose, so that it would destroy all the rust, um, all the uh, the the metallic golems on the enemy side, and hope that they open up on that side. Oh man. <laughs> oh shit. Clones. I know the spell clone doesn't work like that, but it was. It reminded me of Star Wars. Oh. You could just, you could clone. Well, you could, you could, you could multiply your forces. Hey, I've got ten thousand soldiers, and just keep cloning them, and 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 keeping their clones asleep, and then waking up their clones and sending them out in the, in the into war. I mean, that would be psychologically horrifying to see to see clones of yourself dying in war, begging you you dying, looking yourself in the face, begging yourself to 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 save their life. Or to shoot them and kill them while they like burn and stuff. Pretty nasty. Um, Foolish Kiwi says maybe mana is like oil, a limited, expensive part of a ration, and maybe even the reason there's a war in the first place to gain access to the mines for it. Right. Oh, I mean, it could be maybe you have to to mine for it, like literally, like like um um uh, like dwarves, or they could be like ley lines or feng shui sites where you're fighting to get to a particular location that's a fount for magic, or there's a limited amount of magic in the first place. And here, here's a weird idea. If you cast a spell, you release your hold on the magic, allowing it to be free so somebody else could take it. So maybe it's not very smart to tip your hand, but sometimes you really have to. So it's, it's kind of like, um, it, it, it would almost be, it's like throwing a dagger at someone. Once you throw the dagger at someone, now the dagger's out of your hand. And and although you could do damage to them, now the dagger's in their hand and they could throw it back at you. I, I, that's a weird, a, a dumb analogy, but maybe something like that. Uh, Prue says, a lot of citizens in those small areas will, will find ways to rebel in hiding, while others will just sigh and do whatever they're told, hoping that um, their harvest is not ruined by act of war. Oh hell yeah! There, there's. I think one thing that we we um, we brilliant role players is again we like to uh, uh, the simplest, most common denominator. But what, when you start talking about tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, tens of millions of people involved in war, there there are no. You're gonna find whole societies and factions that are not loyal, that don't want to be involved, that um, that are going to run from it, that they're not going to be as effective, that you're, now you've got to feed them, now you've got to house them, you've got to keep their morale high. Um, you, you have the, the dissemination of information, the dissemination of 
of materials? Do you have enough swords? Do you have enough spears? Um, th those spell casters, I'm, I'm sorry to say, despite the fact that you would have spell casters on each side of war, there's going to be a number of them that are just going to be arrogant or self-interested or just thinking to them in their, their to themselves like why would i want to i have the power to teleport i'm just leaving i'm just going to teleport away i don't have a i don't have a stake in this war and now mind you there will be plenty that are just like um i want to kill the enemy um at any and all costs but if it takes a long time to learn magic I, it's like i'm i i spent 15 years studying this stuff i'm not going to waste it by getting accidentally shot in the back of the head, right? Or or getting a, a spear through the chest from some random dude that just picked up a, a picked up a weapon last week and decided to throw it through the air, right? It's it's like I'm staying far behind enemy lines and I'm gonna demand, you know, top billing from those who are ordering me to fight. And by the way, I can shape change. I'm I'm the hell out of here. You know what I mean? I mean those things will happen. Um <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Rickard says, if everyone looks the same and all you know is people looking the same, does the appearance really convey a sense of self? Uh, no, that's the whole point of military training, right? It's not about self. It's about the group, um, the, supporting the group. It's the destruction of identity uh, for the greater self. I mean, for good or bad, that's just what it is, right? You know, we all march together. We sing the same songs. We, we, it's, it's the pushing people out of planes and, and, and hoping for the best. It's the, the storming of Normandy and, and, you, you know, um, overwhelming people with numbers and sacrificing the, the tens of thousands that died trying to storm Normandy. You know what I mean? It's, it's the, it's the, it's not about you, it's about the, the greater people and convincing people of that um, while they're sitting there with missing their arm or shot through the stomach or watching their entrails pulled out or something like that, right? Um, Zala says, that's when people start getting tattoos, site customization on clothing. Oh yeah, the battle-hardened guys that rip the sleeves off of their, their outfits, um, paint, painting um, things on, on their uh, baseball caps and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like getting the, get, getting certain trophies and stuff to, to, so that they, they look slightly different. Everyone getting a nickname, um, being known for something or earning a nickname because of something that they did. Um, that, that happens all the time with soldiers. Uh, Jared says, I heard that potatoes were popular because peasants could just leave them buried in a field. And when the army came through demanding food, they just shrug and point at their <laughs> empty pantries. <laughs> <laughs> that is slick. I like that. Uh, we don't have anything. No chickens. No, sorry. <laughs> dig that. Dig that stuff up. Yeah. Um. That's a. That's a thing too, man. Military, large military forces ravaged countrysides, man. I mean, they just they took anything and everything. I mean, they were parasites to the common people. Uh, they they took all all stored food and lodging and stuff. I mean, we don't. We, we we gamers like to think of the numbers like, oh, well, they just they're just going to have plate armor and spells and just launch them at each other. But feeding people, having them sleep somewhere, um, simply just having dry feet is is a or a soft place to sleep or not hearing screams in the night um, or watching being a fresh newbie in the battlefield and watching thousands of people pulled from the front lines and all of them are like insane, mad, um, hacked in half and stuff is, is something that really affects the, the, the morale of the people. Um, Zevron says, imagine the elves being able to, uh, uh, beings that live for a thousand years, they have seen a lot of shit, new spells, new weapons, new allies, new enemies. They, they may even not even feel much passion when they when they hear of yet another battle. They're like, we've seen this before. We know where it's going to end. We don't any, want any parts of it. Or they may want parts of it knowing that um, the younger lived races are just sacrificial lambs to something they've seen before. Um, Prue says, occupy people tend not to be the most enthusiastic co co-workers. <laughs> hey, hell yeah. I mean, it's one thing in the beginning, it's like, Ray, 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 yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna, um, I'm not in battle, but I'm a farmer. I'm gonna give some of my supplies to you guys. And it works once. 
then and then when you start suffering through a, a, a terrible winter or famine and then and then the military comes through yet again and they're demanding more and more you're just like you know you're just holding up middle fingers behind your back like please just leave we have nothing and then of course they start taking your self-respect um they start you know looking at you like you're less than less than a, a human um they start taking your families you know um they, they, you know hey we, they start taking your children um lots of sexual assault and things like that from from your own allies let alone the enemy right or it is tactical tactically advan advantageous to burn your house down so when they retreat, the enemy doesn't have a place to stay. And you're like, this is my house. And like, and they're busy pouring oil all around the base of it and throwing hot, you know, uh, pitch across it and, and setting it on fire. They're like, look, we're, we're retreating. We can't have them live in your house, right? Uh, Azala says, um, quote, God made men. Colt made them, Colt made them equal. Magic messed everything up. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's the other thing, too. World, a world war equalized the ability from for one person to kill the other for a long time power rested in the hands of kings and queens they were almost thought of as being divine same thing with the church right it was the common person put blood and birth and um they put people on a higher pedestal and it was always known that um, I'm a lesser person. These people are greater. And these world wars, you know, Napoleonic age and things, you start putting like bow and arrows and crossbows and then firearms into more and more people, recruiting younger and younger people to fight for you and just throwing weapons in their hands. Uh, eventually, they start to learn that the people in power are no better than you or, or actually in many ways like a lesser a lesser person than you like hey if they're so great why aren't they in the front lines and i think that has a huge change on society too when you no longer think of your your leaders and your elders as as having some form of divine um gifts as it were uh psychologically or uh mentally or through education or something um rickard says so clones wouldn't really matter when it comes to appearance um was what I was going for. Oh, oh I, I see what you're saying. You're just saying like, like, <laughs> I I get it. That that is not what they look like. It's just that they they work, right? Um, it's just that you you're just throwing the just throwing the bodies out there, man. Just um, pretty nasty. Um, Foolish Kiwi says a functional military is not just soldiers. It is medical, communications, fabrication, textile and cloth work, research, propaganda. Man, there's so many branches needed to win a war. Um, I, from what I understand. Is, isn't there some kind of statistic like for every soldier, there's like 20 to 50 personnel that are needed to make to keep that soldier in battle when it comes to um, uh, like my grandmother during uh, World War Two worked. Uh, it, I was born and raised in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and there was a the naval shipyard and in the naval shipyard, they had a. Um, big military bar barracks. Right. And a lot of ladies worked there and they they sewed together uniforms. They put together boots and shoes and pants and shirts and and cuffs and buttons and all those kind of things. I mean, you know, just having clothing, um, just feeding them, like you said, textile and cloth work, research and propaganda, just the propaganda of of people encouraging those on back home to keep sending their resources into the war front and convincing them that things work. That's what gladiator arenas were for, right? It was, uh, hey, we're gonna show you what our battles looked like and see how we won. Give some more, give some more of your gold, give some more of your, your wheat and rice and grains and things like that. Um, yeah, de definitely, definitely uh, a lot more than just a soldier with a sword and a, and a crossbow or magic or something like that. Um, Prue says wars are all, are always amazing time for people who are good at, at turning a profit. <laughs> yeah. War has tons of amazing business opportunities. Definitely black market, right? Um, we, we tend to think of us versus them, but man, profiteering is a big thing. Uh, hell the even, even the idea of allies stealing from each other to get more supplies, whether it's 
ammunition, food, beds, um, shoes. They would they would uh, requisitioning more things. Uh, supplies would happen, and they would have some of them would have to deal with black marketeers who would steal from the enemy and sell weapons and ammo and food back and forth across enemy lines. And so those black marketeers would just keep going back and forth to keep almost to keep the war effort going so that they could make a profit. Um, uh, here we go. The, I love the Zevron 08 says uh, bards give people stories on the glorious battles, the allies gaining territory. They could travel both. They could travel both or how, or however there may be, both sides playing everyone for food, coin, lodging. Yeah, bards, um, entertainment um, of the of the benign and illicit kind. You know, basically songs, stories, those same bards would be giving out information. They could kind of be like spies in a way, um, hearing about both sides of the conflict. They could be transferring um, information. Maybe there are families that are split and they just need to get information from one side to the other. How's my brother doing? How's my my um, village? Is it still around? Um, yes, <laughs> as Alice says, still need the little drummer boy. Yep, uh, the playing of the flutes on the front lines, the horn blowers um, using trumpeteers and and uh drummers and banner the ones who carried the banners were ways to um for communication before electronic communication was a thing that's how they would um manip uh, so the commanders could tell their forces what to do whether they would lift up certain banners the yellow banner would be this way three red banners would do one thing um the the the, the drumming would would like drown out the panic in the heart. It would almost be like a heartbeat. You know, the, the drummer, the trumpeteers that would um, bring them into battle and they would blow the horns when battle would start. They would blow the horns when um, the French revelry that the United States uses now, the you know, um, was a thing that would start battles. And then there was another one that would end battles. I can't remember the beat of the one that would end battles, but yeah. Um, <laughs> a gnome drummer boy. <laughs> yep. A dead man storyteller says a uh, Pearl Harbor in World War II, just prior to the attack, had close to 10 support per personnel for every soldier. And that's a thing. That, that's a real thing. You know, sure, you can have ships filled, you know, with, with, um, uh, privateers and a navy, but somebody's got to build the ships. Someone has to, uh, outfit the ships. Hell, a, an aircraft carrier has a ton of personnel just to launch one pilot in the air. You've got people to fuel them. You have people that deal with the ordnance. You have literally just a crew of people that do nothing but but uh, walk across the deck of an aircraft carrier to pick up small pieces of uh, plastic and metal so it doesn't fly through the air and, and kill someone. Um, there are just people who feed everyone, 24 hours a day feeding everyone. Um, you know, all those, there's, there's a crew to keep fires from from um all they do is put out fires on the ship and save people that's their whole job you know that kind of thing so foolish kiwi said to this day you can enlist in the military as a musician actually you just don't go into combat unless necessary um the the, the militaries recruit musicians writers um photographers uh and uh basically in, a, in essence propaganda people um a very underrated movie um by tom cruise is a uh, um i was about to say the day after tomorrow um the edge of tomorrow and his job was to be was a propagandist before he of course kept living his day over and over again um his, his job was to recruit people and you know make things sound good give money to for um for bonds right Th that kind of thing uh rickard uh uh says uh excuse me but Communication mages, sendings, sonic spells, teleportation spells to go back and forth for messaging and such. And exactly, I think support spells would be very important. Um, far more valuable than a mage on a battlefield casting a fireball, because if the mage gets killed, he's done. But a mage that can send a message spell 20, 50, 100 times, is a very valuable thing, right? The, the the teleporter who doesn't just teleport behind enemy lines, but teleports in food and ammo, or is able to extract um, in, injured personnel, 
um, that kind of thing, um, to set, <laughs> bringing healing potions and dropping them off and leaving, right, um, would be a thing. Uh, uh, Zephron OA says, Warlock's making packs to win battles. <laughs> Oh shit! <laughs> Only to lose brutally when it's time to collect. Hey, war the warlock, the the pack makers of warlocks, using both sides to fight against each other and just picking up the pieces of who wins, right? <laughs> both sides fighting and find out that they're actually all warlocks for the same side. They all have the same warlock patron fighting each other. Nasty. Um, Foolish Kiwi says the Edge of Tomorrow is based on a manga called All You Need Is Kill. Yeah, yeah, and and is a great read, by the way. Uh, yeah, All You Need Is Kill is the is the manga it's based on. It's, it's nasty. Um, Rickard says mages work so much better as support over damage. Um, and the v how many resources were spent to become a mage, right? How much time? How much money was spent? Um how many libraries were needed, how many schools, um, how many teachers were instructing these people. That's that's another thing too. How much, how many resources, how much time, energy, and resources were spent to get educate these people that you might not want to throw them in the front lines, but to be support, right? Now, of course, if they were born that way, you could just, I mean, if it's just as simple as, uh, as um, I don't know, marking them with a rune and, and sending them out as like, um, <laughs> chaos mages and put cattle prod prodding them and hoping that they explode on the other side. Hey, it might, it hey, might be a dime a dozen. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, Zala says, I don't know. I like my glass cannon mages. This is what I play. Always play when I do play them. Yeah. But well, one glass cannon mage is cool. Uh, 200 of them might be a waste. Uh, Rickard says cannons as such, uh, does lots of damage, but they can't work the supply lines, right? They don't feed people. They don't um, protect soldiers that are dying around them. You know what I mean? There, there's always, in in any war, there's always going to be a limitation about something. Uh, Azalus is getting an enchanter to enchant all the cannons and cannonballs to do more damage. Hell yeah. Um, awaken the cannons. <laughs> yeah. Um, have all your guns enchanted to do force damage. No armor can help. Um uh, that is, of course, if they're aiming at the right thing, right? Um, Mage is casting uh, that one spell that replenishes non-magical ammo. Hell yeah. Now, what we didn't think about are, is, and this is something that I love, is the chaos of war, right? We don't think about um, the, the random arrows being launched through the air and being hit by them. We don't think about the, if, if, if this is an arcane war, that the, the, the random elemental runs through the where the the party is at or <clears throat> excuse me running through a battlefield that's um that's pockmarked with um uh, where an ex explosions had gone off and the pcs have to run up and down craters left from from explosive ordnance or something and it's filled with acid and ooze or poison gas runs over a, a battlefield or something i mean uh i i just love the idea of like um, instead of dungeons with traps, it's whole battlefields covered with those traps. So there could be, instead of one pit trap in a dungeon, there could be 200 pit traps that you have to watch out for them. It could be it, you're running over exp explosive runes painted into the ground or however they're in the ground. It could be r random wandering undead that are going after you. Um, like I said, poison gas and fog, you can't see where you're going. It could be just errant, a blast of lightning bolts just flying back and forth across from one side to the other, and you just happen to be in in the middle of it, right? It's just random, random chaos going on all around, and having to run through a battlefield and watch out for things like that. Well, hell, just simple mundane stuff: catapult launches, um, arrows being launched through the air, and the PCs have to get from one area to another. Um, Zevron says, "I'm I'm reminded of the of." The, the Korgon from Mass Effect, imagine half-orcs or Dragonborn being very skilled at war and as a result of uh, of a side introduces an infertility curse. Ooh, who, who's to say that Dragonborn, half-orcs, um, tieflings aren't a result of war um, for the sole purpose of breeding them for war and then imagine what happens when war is done. Right, they're bred for war. That, well, hell, that's where Eberron's um, Warforged came from. Right, uh, mass-produced 
uh, awakened, mass produced awakened golems, right? And and what happens when that war is over? Uh, in World, Foolish Kiwi says in World War II, the Soviets used bullets with depleting radioactive materials in suicide squads that were prisoners from death row. I feel like it, in some ways, a lot of magic would be caustic and dangerous. Um, the 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 safety of magic might be gone in this setting, right? Um, a true mage is like, well, we have to be dangerous to you know to teach the the, the fireball spell because we don't want it to get out of control. And then he, the the allies are just like, wait a minute, we don't have time to 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 tr triple test it. Just go out there and do it. I don't care if you you light yourself on fire, right? <laughs> uh, Azala says. Um, says uh, also 200 glass cannons aren't a waste. They lay waste to everything. Uh, yeah, yeah. imagine 200 fireballs all being slung at once. Y yes, but it's once, right? Now, I'm not saying it wouldn't happen. I'm saying y you, would win, you would win a battle, you may not win a war, right? Uh, 200 fireballs, they all go off, a lot of destruction. Then the enemy's like, oh, I already know what they can do, so we will not be there any longer. And so then they use spies to find out where these 200 glass cannons are going to be, or they leave them, um, they use a decoy so that they fire off all 200 fireballs in, into a place that's not useful anymore, right? It's all those things. It's all, it's all, it's using a, a world war would have so many different tactics and you could, you could play so many different um, scenarios out. Um, uh, uh, uplifting more primitive races. Yeah. <laughs> I love the spell napalm of no napalm in the morning. <laughs> I love. Oh, man. Uh, real quick. Uh, all right, babe. Be, oh, care out here. be careful. Still coming down. I know. All day long. Love you, love you baby. It's coming down hard. All right. Be very careful. All right, be careful. I'm getting out of here. Too. <laughs> yeah, I love the smell of napalm in the morning. <laughs> You know, I, I love the smell of hellish rebuke. <laughs> yeah, smells just the same. Um, Rickard says 200 fireballs versus 200 cannonballs. Uh, 8d6 versus 8d10. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, now, now, now that's just the numbers, right? Um, imagine that being thrown against, I don't know, how many walls of stone? How many melded earth? How many, you know, like it wouldn't be one sided, right? If that's going to happen, somebody, the, the first thing I'd want to know is, does the other side have those fireballs or cannonballs? And if so, we're not going to be in the way. Uh, we're we're going to let them uh, blow their load and, and, uh, and I don't know, attack them with uh, 1D4 daggers because most of them would probably be regular human beings from, from the, the back lines or hire the bard that goes into the, the troops the night before to entertain them and uh, poison the food. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But everyone says, but Rickard, how many score a crit? <laughs> yeah. How many make their saving throws? Right. I mean, it's more than just, it's more than just a simple uh, armor class damage saving throw, right? A war is a thing that is, uh complicated and um messy and isn't really supported in a one-on-one -on -one role playing game um because the 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 chaos of war is the thing that is very difficult to emulate it's the it's the person who doesn't want to fight it's the person who gets scared it's the um the person whose spell doesn't go off. Uh, it's the person who gets killed and the spell goes off in their own, um, amongst their own group, you know what I mean? Or the person who is um, um, bribed or tricked or uh, convinced to work against their own people and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, all right, as everyone says, uh, all right, gotta, gotta walk to work. Hope you don't freeze to death. You know what, two days at negative 20, and now we've get now it's moved up into like the teens and twenties, and we're getting like uh, snow all day. So pretty nasty, man. But anyway, guys, um, thank you very much for 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 uh, <laughs> for not just joining me, but um, but but hell, just uh, just playing along, having fun, uh, world selling. I guess at this point, instead of world building, I I didn't realize I was sorry. I didn't realize I was actually taking a challenge, but maybe I am. Um, uh, we'll, we're going to go into 
uh, what what Dead, Dead Man, the storyteller, says about um, modern day, near future, far future, cyberpunk. Uh, I promised we would get into high technology. Apparently, we're into the magic form of it, but but whatever the case may be, we we will. I know it's taken us a while, but we're 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 going to get there uh, definitely because we've just passed the world wars, and um, and so now we can flow into like modern day and so on and so forth and kind of sell what what are some of the cool things we can use in them um, as a backdrop for a setting. So guys, thank you very much. Fulski says, if you focus on the effect the chaos has on those individuals though, it's a great story. Um, that's really what war is about, right? It's the, it's the external struggle, the, the fighting against the enemy, and then it's the internal struggle of watching what happens through the, the horrors of war. Um, it's also the futility of war. Um, the movie, the bridge, I'm not giving anything away. The movie's been out for, for generations. Uh, the, the bridge over River Kwai is a story about the enemy forcing um, um, uh, captured soldiers to build a bridge. They fully build the bridge only to, only to uh, uh, destroy it at the end, right? It's the futility of war. It's, the, it, it's, it's finding tiny glimmers of hope in a desperate situation. So it's trying to save a small child while tens of thousands die around you. Um, it's, it's the soldiers who just want to, uh, you know, always seem to go to these small villages to meet a young lady that they can't even speak the same language and just smile and dance and maybe have a meal. And, you know, you know, maybe share a bed or something, only to find out that the very next day um, they're ordered to kill them, or when they leave, they're they are murdered and they're you know brought out for um, helping the soldiers. They're brought out into a field and murdered in in the middle of the um, uh, you know the fields and things like that. Um, it's it's all those things. Uh, all quiet on the Western Front is the same that uh, Prue mentions. Um, a dead man storyteller says the alchemist and full metal alchemist um wheel of time uh man yeah um yeah uh, wow it's just so it, there's so much there's so much um destruction of moral of of sorry of mo so much destruction of morality that happens in war that you start to lose sight of what the purpose is in fighting like rickard says arcane gates between between or over the enemy camp and inside of a volcano, you know, like here we are. It, it, don't get me wrong; it's fun to think of these things, but how how much brutality you can think of with just very small amounts of like magic and technology, and then taking that and expanding it out. I mean, that's where napalm comes from, and carpet bombing, and the the burning, the the you know. Um, nuclear weapons come from you know the, the atomic weapons those that's where that comes from that's where it's like oh no i know how to kill people better no 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 i know a better way of, of destroying people no i know a better way of destroying people and then it, and then inside you have all these innocent 16 17 8 year olds who 18 year olds um on the front lines that are just looking around just like what the fuck like really and all you're doing all you did is throw a gun in my hands throw me out of a plane and I didn't even want to be there, throw me on the front lines and go, yeah, go for it. Uh, just please survive. You know what I mean? It's it's crazy. So guys, thank you very much. Um, glad we got this talk. Pretty nasty stuff, but whatever. War is nasty. Um, using it as a backdrop in a war is crazy. I, um, I am, for the, for, for the, the sake of, um, of, <laughs> self-promotion um i still am writing uh battlefields is going to be one of our uh, uh cinematic environs um it's going to be one of our cinematic environs uh and battlefields will be a thing that will um it's y y y all all the stuff you guys are talking about and more uh yeah i've been writing that stuff down too so yeah great thing um <laughs> yeah um Sojo Senki, World War One anime is a good watch. Um, Prue says, says you start out with, quote, that's insane and evil. I would never do that. But as time and war goes by, you get there and further. I absolutely agree with that. Um, the, 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 the idea of I would never turn anyway, 
anybody away from my home to locking your doors while people on the outside are begging for food and sustenance and protection. The, the, those people were my allies and I would visit that country any day. I had great vacations there to, um, I would murder them in my sleep, right? Um, even today, we, we, um, uh, we see the remnants of war and how strange it is that we are not just allies, but not just friendly, but friends, true friends uh, across, you know, across and around the world. But in the past, we would then be recruited to have to kill each other. Um, and it brings, I'm, I'm going to end this where it brings together the, the, the thing that happened in World War I, where the soldiers came out of their trenches to uh, celebrate Christmas together. And both sides' leadership hated that. But they couldn't even speak the same language. And they came out of the trenches um, a, uh, after, uh, supposedly after one soldier began singing, um, singing uh, Christmas songs. And they started exchanging gifts. They exchanged cigarettes and food and um, little things from each other's side from pieces of home. They played soccer um, just to feel some of that humanity only to have to go back in those trenches and try to kill each other yet again. And I, I couldn't imagine playing playing football, soccer with somebody. I just exchanged food and laughed and sang songs and then to come back across and see that I, you know, me and my allies killed the enemy who were just friends of ours. Just we just got together. You know what I mean? Um uh, I, I forget the name of the movie, but it's about a group of soldiers stuck in a trench and supernatural stuff slowly kills them off. Yeah, I, I don't remember that. Um, I know there's Wolfenstein, Wolfenstein, I think is one with a um, World War II werewolves or something. So yeah, there's a bunch of things like that. And I didn't want to get into the political, I didn't want to go into like our side versus their side or anything. Um, it's just the insanity of war. Um, and and how the futility of fighting for something that maybe you don't even believe in, um, sides fighting because they have to fight only to, to survive and just like whatever, death watch. That's it, death watch. So anyway, guys, I want to thank you guys for, for – <laughs> for for not just supporting me but just, just hell just being involved in it i hope i can make your day just a little bit better um hell if, if you're on a commute it's, it's first thing in the morning maybe you're getting off of work it's in the middle of your day or you're at work or something so i'm glad i could just yeah just sit here just toss things in the head give people ideas and stuff and by the way you guys um give me far more energy than, than i could ever need so thank you very much guys i gotta get out of here it's gonna be a nasty day here in the middle of ohio so everyone have a great day i'll see you later